Kitchen Table by Martin Foreman Read by Gordon Houston Marie is the most beautiful girl in the world. Okay, that's an exaggeration. She'd never win a beauty contest. She doesn't wear makeup and she doesn't look plastic, but she's the prettiest girl in class, perhaps in the whole school. She's got thick black hair, dark eyes, round cheeks and beautiful lips. She looks like a painting, something pre-Raphaelite, Michael says. He should know. He's the art expert. I don't care what type she is. I just know she's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I used to think she was stuck up, the way she sat at the back and didn't talk to anyone. Now I know she's just reserved, keeps herself to herself. She wants to respect you before she'll spend time with you, and she needs to know who you are before she can respect you. It was Michael who said if I wanted a girlfriend, I could do worse than Jessica or Marie. That was after our big row. The one I caused by saying if I didn't find a girl to go out with soon, people might start thinking I was gay. I said there were enough gays in the family and it was a good thing we only had English together or everyone would be gossiping about him and me. Michael blew his top and didn't speak to me for three days afterwards. It was stupid. He's my best friend and the only person I really trust. Anyway, I wanted a real girlfriend, not some tart who just wanted sex. That's all some boys want. I mean, of course, I'd like sex with any girl if I knew they couldn't get pregnant. But you can never be sure. You can't trust them if they say they're on the pill, and you never know if the condom's going to break. Can't take the chance. So casual sex is out, no matter how tempting it is. Michael used to think I felt like that because him and mum go on sometimes about respect for women. But it's nothing to do with that. It's the kid that makes me feel that way. Because I'm never going to risk making a baby. Never, if I can't be sure that I'll be there to look after him. The minute your sperm fertilises the egg, you're responsible. It would be all right if she had had an abortion, but you can't force her to. And what if she moved and you never saw her again? You'd go through life wondering if you've got a kid growing up somewhere who'll never know his father. You've got to be there for him. Because if you're not, then you're not fit to call yourself a human being. I tried Jessica first. She's pretty and brainy and fun to be with. I thought it would be cool going out with Jess, and I started chatting to her in the breaks. It was all right, but a bit weird. Some of the time she'd be perfectly straightforward, and sometimes it felt like she was insulting me. She made me feel thick, and I'm not. Michael said she was testing me, like I was testing her, only in a different way. I suppose he's right. We went out once, but it didn't work. She couldn't keep her mouth shut, and I got bored. Well, no harm done. We still talk to each other sometimes. After Jess, I started thinking about Marie. At first, like I said, I thought she was stuck up. Then I thought that was unfair because I hardly knew her. I worked out all sorts of strategies to get to know her. I'd accidentally pass her in the corridor, and I'd say I'd lost the paper I'd written down some homework on, and could she remind me what it was? Or I'd hold the door open as she was coming into the classroom and give her a smile. Or I'd be sitting on her desk when she came in and apologise and move out the way. Two or three meetings like that, and we'd soon be chatting like old friends. Didn't happen like that. She just smiled at me at the end of history one day, and we started chatting. We compared projects. She's doing wars in Europe, and I'm doing 18th century commerce. And the next thing I knew, I was walking her home. I can't remember what we talked about, but it was cool. She wasn't stuck up, and I wasn't a fool, and she smiled a lot. I left her at the corner of her road, and when I got the bus back, I wasn't thinking, and I got on the one going the wrong way. I didn't get home till after six. Mum was out, but Carol wasn't too pleased. I said I'd been to Burger King with a couple of friends. I wasn't going to tell her or anyone about Marie until I was sure how we both felt. I thought she fancied me, but I wasn't sure. I might walk into school the next day and she'd give me the brush off. But she didn't give me the brush off. I mean, she didn't fall at my feet or anything like that, but the next morning we said hi like we were old friends and we chatted but didn't start making eyes at each other like some couples do after the first date. It was two days before I walked her home again. Then I said, how about four of us going out one evening, and she thought it was a good idea. She knew Michael and Faye already, so we all went to the cinema. By the end of the evening, it was pretty obvious that Marie and I were becoming an item. I think Faye thought she and Michael were becoming one too, but that never happened. After that, Marie and I began going out on our own. Pretty soon, everyone at school knew about us. Some of the boys made stupid comments. I acted ticked off, but I wasn't. I felt really good about having a girlfriend at last. She's got this wonderfully normal family. Her father owns a small business, importing health products. 
Her mum works in the personnel department of some company off the ring road. She's got an older sister at University in Wales. They have this nice house overlooking the park. You go in and it feels like a normal home with regular pictures in the walls and there's a big Labrador, Caesar, who jumps all over you. Her mum's a lot like her. In some ways, being with her dad is strange, but I really like him. There's a huge difference in the way he and I get on together, compared to me and Marie or me and Marie's mum. I haven't quite worked out whether he likes me or he's just being polite. Sometimes I'm disappointed when I go over and he's not there. And that makes me feel guilty because it's really Marie I've come to see. Then I spend five minutes with her and I forget all about him. At first, I used to worry that I wasn't doing anything to impress her. Then it hit me one day. I didn't need to impress her. We've got a lot in common. We like the same music, we've got the same sense of humour, we can talk about serious stuff without boring each other. She likes that I don't hang around in a gang, and I like that she isn't a gossip. And neither of us do drugs. I once got drunk with her, and that was a big mistake. My voice too loud and spouting a lot of shit. She thought it was funny, but the next day I felt like an idiot. I decided only ever to get drunk with guys. They don't care how you behave. Marie's the first stranger I wanted to know everything about me, even though I was afraid of what she might think. I told her about Mum and Carol on our first real date. She was fine about it. She thinks it's weird that I've never asked her round, but I couldn't cope with the three of them together. One day, I used to think, but it'll never happen now. Of course, I've had to tell Mum and Carol about Marie. I wasn't going to lie all the time. They asked what classes she was in and what she was like. Carol said I should bring her round, and I said I might, and that was the end of it. I don't know what Marie told her parents about me. She must have said something, because they've never asked about my own life. I hope they don't think I'm ashamed of Mum and Carol, because I I'm not. Nobody's got a right to be homophobic. Christ knows there's enough injustice in the world without adding to it. It's not Mum being a lesbian that gets me mad, it's the other thing I can't get over. It's difficult to describe what it's like at home. If they were someone else's parents, I think we'd get on no problem. Carol can be fun. She's not as tough as Mum, and she laughs more. Mum's the fierce one. If she were a stranger, I might even like her. I admire her for sticking up for what she believes in, but uh, I've never been able to see Mum and Carol differently. Not since it hit me what they did to me. Michael thinks I'm crazy. He says his dad was a violent alcoholic who beat his mother. He's got two memories that really stand out. Once, when he was about nine, he woke up in the middle of the night to hear his father in the street shouting loud enough to wake the dead that his mother was a fucking dyke who'd stolen his son. She'd had to call the police and drag him away, and she and Michael had had to move soon after that. His second memory is of his dad sober, or pretending to be sober, telling him that he loved him, that he was going to be a better father from now on, and he, he would come and take him out and get to know him as a father should every week from then on. And that was the last Michael heard from him for almost five years. So he says, I'm just as well not having a father, and I'm lucky having two parents when he's only had one. But what I can't get Michael to understand is that he can decide whether or not to love his father because he knows who he is. I don't know who my father is, and I never will. Never. I never have had, and never will have, a father. That big gaping hole is the most important thing in my life to me. Sometimes I'm in the street and I look at a man and I'll think, are you my father? Did you make me? Or I'll see someone and think he looks just like me, the same curly fair hair and thin face like mine. But when I get nearer, he doesn't look like me at all. Not that that means anything. Features change from generation to generation, so my father doesn't have to look like me. Just be white and have blue eyes, that's all. He could be anyone. Anyone at all. One day... When I was about twelve, I was sure I saw him. I was walking past the shop when I saw him coming out. I couldn't move, I just stood there, shaking like a leaf because I was so sure it was him. At the same time, I was thinking, it can't be. He looks just like everyone else, and I'd always had this image of my dad being someone special. Then I thought, if I'm no one special, he's not going to be either. So he could be my dad, after all. I kept staring at him, and my mind was blank. All I could think about was, should I go up to him and say, Are you my father? Did you ever donate your sperm to a clinic in London? Why? Why did you do it? Why did you leave me? Why have you never tried to find me? I imagined walking up to him and asking all these questions. 
But if he wasn't my father, it wasn't fair to upset him. And if it was him, he'd probably deny it. Or if he didn't deny it, he might turn out to be a complete moron and finding that out might be worse than not knowing who he was. All these ideas going through my head as he was walking away. I followed him, round the corner to the bus stop. I went and stood right behind him. He even turned round and saw me, but he didn't say anything. Close up, he didn't look as much like me as I'd thought, but that didn't matter. He could still have been my father. He didn't react at all. I thought he'd say something and I'd answer back and pretty soon we'd find out that we were father and son. Or he'd recognise me and that would remind him of what he'd done. His past would come back to haunt him. Then a number 43 came along and he got on it and I didn't have the guts to follow him. I watched it drive away and that was the last I saw of him. I went back to that shop a couple of times after that but I never saw him again. I decided in the end he probably wasn't my dad. It would be too much of a coincidence if he'd ended up in the same town as Mum and me were living in. Besides, lots of sperm donors were medical students, so he's probably a doctor somewhere, and that man didn't look like a doctor. He looked kind of sad. Then I thought maybe he's sad because of me. He regretted what he did, and if we were to find each other, it would make both of us happy again. We could see each other after school or at weekends. It wasn't as if I wanted him to marry Mum or Carol. He could stay in his part of town, and they could stay here, and I could spend time with both of them. That was my fantasy. Still is sometimes. I know that man wasn't my dad. Sometimes I think I'll never find him, no matter how hard I try. Last year I finally got the name of the clinic out of Carroll. I phoned them and the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, and they were no use at all. They told me to see a lawyer. But the only one I tried said I'd have to wait until I was 18, and even then I might not be able to find out. That makes me sad. Creating life is the most awesome thing anyone can do, but my mum and dad can be as irresponsible as they like, and I'm the one who has to suffer. Perhaps it's a good thing I'll never find him. Because if I ever do, I'll be so fucking angry I might kill him. Some nights, when I can't sleep, I make myself tired by punching my pillow, pretending it's him. I hate him so much. What right has he got to wank into a bottle in some clinic and walk away, knowing that one of his sperm, maybe more than one, is going to turn into a kid and he'll never be there for it? What right has he got to sell his son's life for however much he got paid? What right has he got to abandon me or any child? He knew what he was doing when he created me and the selfish bastard just walked away. Just walked away. He owes me, he does. Whoever he is, wherever he is, he owes me 18 years and I'll never forgive him. Ever. I'll never forgive Mum and Carol either. They never offered me a chance to have a father. They never asked how I wanted to be brought up. Thought it didn't matter. Perhaps it doesn't at first. When you're a kid, you don't realise that things can be different. You just accept them. They took care of me, they fed me, they gave me toys and I had friends and I called them Mummy Adrian and Mummy Carol and everything was okay until I was about seven or eight. Then I began to understand that most kids had fathers and I didn't. I asked them about it and all they said was not to worry about not having a daddy because lots of other children didn't have daddies either. I was lucky because I was special. I didn't happen by accident, I was created out of love. I knew some of what they were saying was true but not all of it. It was another couple of years until I understood that you can't have fertilization without a man, so I had to have a father somewhere. They said I didn't, and I got mad and said they'd stolen him. At first they said I was being silly, but I went on and on about it so much that one day they told me about the clinic, and they said my father didn't want to be found, so they gave me that book to read. I didn't believe them about my father. Not even when I read that book and it explained about sperm donation. It said some men wanted to be anonymous, but I was sure my father wouldn't. He'd love me like I'd love my son. I had this fantasy that Carol and Mum knew he was trying to find me and they wouldn't tell me. It was only when I talked it through with Michael that I finally got it into my head that my dad didn't want me. He'd run away from me. I read a lot of other things in that book too, like the two women who did it on the kitchen table. One of them lying back and the other with a wooden spoon. There was even a drawing and the woman on the table had no clothes on. That made me sick, thinking about Carol and Mum, even if they didn't do it that way. 
Michael said that lots of babies are conceived in worse circumstances. The father's drunk, he's sure his father was, or the mother got raped, or the father left town the next day, and things like that. I mean, he's right, but that doesn't make me feel any better. You still know who the father is, or there's a chance you can find out. Years later, you can knock on his door, he'll open it, and you'll say, Hey, Dad, it's me, and by then, he'll have sorted his life out and be really happy that you found him and everything will be okay. Michael will never understand. He's swallowed the whole story that I was a wanted baby. A choice Carol and Mum made out of love. Well, fuck them. It was love for themselves, it was greed, it was selfishness, but it wasn't love for me. If Carol and Mum had really loved me, they would have asked what I wanted. Then they wouldn't have done it, because they know that I wanted a father and they couldn't provide a father. Then you wouldn't have existed, Michael said. That's fine by me, I told him. If they'd asked me before I was born, I would have said, no, not if I don't have a father. I don't want half an identity, I want to be whole. I said that to them once, that they never gave me a chance to find out for myself what my father was like. If they really loved me, they'd move heaven and earth to find my father now. I shouted and called them lots of names. It was the only time I've really seen Mum upset. She gets angry a lot, but this time she was almost crying, and that made me feel good, because I was getting my own back for what she'd done to me. Then Carol got mad, and I was so angry that she was on Mum's side and not mine that I told her that I was glad she'd lost her baby, because the baby would never have to grow up without knowing who her father was. Things have never been the same since. I don't care. They never will be until Mum and Carol realise what it is they've done. Then I started going out with Marie, and it didn't bother me so much. I began to think Michael was right. There's no point in going on about it. Nothing I can do, so I should just get on with life. Marie and I are getting closer all the time, and it gets to the point where we both get pretty sweaty, but I don't push it. We talk and agree that if we use a condom, it'll be okay. It's even good that neither of us have never done it before. She doesn't expect me to come over all slick and experienced, and I'm happy that she wants to do it for the first time with me. We'll take our time. We won't rush it, we say. And if the condom breaks, we'll take care of the baby. I'll be there for her, whatever happens. So last night, I was at her place while her parents were at the cinema. We sat down to watch television, but there was nothing on, so we were kissing more than watching the box. She felt so warm and close, and it felt so, so good. Part of me was saying, that's enough, you don't need anything more, but part of me was saying it was just the beginning, and I wanted it all. Now was the time. So I took a deep breath and said... Perhaps we should go up to her bedroom, thinking she wasn't ready. But she was. I could hardly believe it. I was so happy. It's finally going to happen, I told myself. It's finally going to happen. Started off all right. I wanted it so much it hurt, and I didn't think I could trust myself to hold back. We did what we said we would, take it very slowly, and lay in the bed and kiss. Then I put my hand on her leg and thought about what to do next, and I started to lose it. I began thinking... This is what you do when you're going to have a baby. This is what you do when you're going to have a baby, only this isn't what Mum did when she wanted to have a baby. She didn't make love with my dad. She had a bottle and a wooden spoon, and it wasn't my dad, it was Carol. And Mum was lying on the kitchen table, naked. I couldn't get the kitchen table out of my head. With the salt and pepper and butter dish pushed to one side, and Mum's legs wide open, and Carol standing there with a bottle and wooden spoon, I know they did it in a clinic, but I couldn't get the kitchen table out of my head. And I thought, what Marie and me are going to do was just the same, even though it wasn't, and I'd gone all soft and couldn't get it back. I just stopped. Marie looked at me and wondered what was wrong. She thought maybe she'd done something, and I said, no, it's me. So what is it, she asked, really gently, like it didn't matter. I couldn't tell her. No way could I tell her what I was thinking about mum and the kitchen table and the wooden spoon. All I could do was sit there like a little boy who's done something wrong and say I'm sorry and try not to burst into tears. She was so good about it. She said we could try later. We straightened our clothes and went downstairs and watched some crummy film on television. She held my hand and I know she was waiting for me to try again, but I couldn't. I knew the minute I started to think about making love with her, I'd be thinking about Mum and Carol. Then I was afraid her parents would come home. They would see that something was wrong, and I didn't want them to, so I said I'd better leave. At the door, we both pretended everything was all right, but it wasn't. 
We even kissed kind of funny, like the first time when we weren't sure the other person wanted it. I don't know what she thinks. I hope she doesn't think it's her fault, because it isn't. It could never be her fault, and I can't tell her what the real problem is. If I did, she'd think I was some kind of pervert. She's probably thinking I'm too young, or I'm gay, or there's something wrong with me. Whatever she's thinking, she won't want me back. She'll still be my friend, but we won't be a couple anymore. I'll go into class and she'll be there, but her smile will be different. It'll be kind of cold. I'll smile too and pretend everything's okay, but we'll both know it isn't. Maybe we'll go out one more time and it'll feel so strange that we won't go out together again. Sooner or later, everyone will notice. And even if she doesn't tell them anything, they'll know that I wasn't up to it and they'll start gossiping about me and Michael again. I don't care. I don't care what they say. The only thing that matters is that I've lost Marie. And I'll never find anyone as wonderful as her again. That was Kitchen Table by Martin Foreman. Read by Gordon Houston. Arbery, drama and fiction. Hear more drama and fiction, old and new, on arburyproductions.co.uk.